morning. Good morning. Welcome to Ridgeview Baptist Church and welcome to our service. Uh, trying to be precautionary, we're not going to be having our Sunday evening services, but uh, we're also not going to have congregational hymns. Uh, doing a little reading on the coronavirus, and, and in a moment we'll open in prayer, but just to let you know that uh, there has been a lot of churches that's infected because of the choir and the singing, and uh, it's putting particles of water in the air from each one of us, and everybody else is breathing it in. So if someone may have it, there's a good chance of, of that happening. So we have to be very careful. Now, Tomorrow, I'm going to go to Sam's and see if I can find a box of masks. And what we'll do is we'll put them, uh, George and uh, Doyle, give them out Sunday morning as you come in. And that way we can sing. Might be a sign of a little muffled, but anyway, it'll give us some opportunity to praise the Lord and try to do it in a safe manner. He's given us a good sense of trying to do things in a safe way, but uh, continue to not let anything keep us from worshiping him. This has also occurred in some of the restaurants where people have been in and they, uh, they're practicing social distancing, but the situation has let it be that uh, it's become sort of loud, people talking, and therefore, again, releasing a lot of things. Now, I was reading this because South Korea had uh, opened up their country and their churches uh, way before we did. Now they're having to close them back because uh, of an epidemic of the COVID-19. So we need to take heed of how they did it. So we need to be safe. So just to let you know that uh, Lord willing, next Sunday we'll pass out masks as you come in. And that way you can you can keep them. But the point I'm making is uh, it'll give us an opportunity to be safe in the environment. So I just want to let you know that. Just precautionary. Okay. I just want to say this, if, you, if you're live streaming today and you're out there and you're listening, we're going to be having our scripture from, from Matthew chapter 24 and for those that are here today. But before we do anything, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you, Father, for the day you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to come back into your house and worship you. And Lord, we just pray thy Holy Spirit be here today. Empty me of me, Lord, and fill me with thy Holy Spirit, that everything that I do and I say will be truth and approved by you. Let the Spirit of God preach through me the words that God wants us to hear today. Almighty God, those that are sick and can't be here, we just ask you, Lord, to be with each one of them. Father, bless these that have come today. Bless them, Lord, because they have come because they want to worship you. Now, Lord, we just pray that everything that we do would be honorable and satisfying and pleasing to you in every man. And with this, Lord, we ask for your blessing to be upon this service and upon everything that we do. And we pray that through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Just again, to let you know that uh, it's just some changes that's going to take place for the time being. And when we have the, uh, we're going to have the offertory piano solo. And that way, after that, Scott's going to sing the doxology, and there, therefore, we're just going to start from that point. So, uh, Kay's going to go ahead and, and, and do the piano solo. George, you and uh, Doyle just come forward and do the offering, and we'll go from there. We'll be a little more organized next Sunday, but we're just trying to do this in a safe manner with short notice, okay? <laughs>
and did not have to work with you. Now, Heavenly Father, with this offering, let the faith of you let the Holy Ghost take you out from this morning and pray. Amen. Amen.
so good to see everybody this morning. It's just like coming home, man. Amen. Um, I have a song here that it kind of goes along with kind of what we've been going through. been this homesick before. <coughs> There's a light in the window, the table spread in splendor. Someone standing by the open door. I can see a crystal river so I must be to be 
Jane Stella. I know that she is uh, she is also uh, having some uh, problems, but we need to just continue to lift her in prayer. And Miss uh, Becky Thomas, she has got some health problems that we need to be lifting her up in prayer. We have a lot of folks, and we're so grateful today. And I'm so pleased; just makes my heart happy to see Merlin here today. We need to continue to lift her up. Sincere prayer for every one of them. Uh, so many more that uh, I know that I'm probably going to get kicked in the shins because I didn't mention, but we need to be much in prayer for those that's on our prayer list and our bulletin. So we need to continue to just lift them up. Now, I'm going to say this. If you don't have anything to pray for, you surely have must have been asleep because it is a time we need to be much in prayer. God says pray without ceasing. And that's what we need to do. We'll continue to pray. We we'll just continue to just uh, lift people up. We need to do so. Uh, need to pray for Jim. He he fell off a horse yesterday, and he don't know his injury. He just knows he's sore. I don't know how much longer uh, he's going to want to be a cowboy. But I, y'all pray that he quits being a cowboy. But we thank God for <coughs> all His blessings and. We continue to just ask you, so right this moment, we're going to bow our heads and pray for our sick and for those, Lord, that maybe have the spirit of fear in them. And we need to just lift them up in prayer and hopefully that God is going to move in their hearts to be back in church. Father, again, we thank you so much for all the blessings you bestow upon us, providing for us through all the hard times. And, Lord, you just seem to always know when it's the best. And Lord, we know that because you're our God, you're our Father. We stand before you today as children of God, asking for our brothers and sisters that need prayer, need your touch, that Lord, that you'd just touch them, whatever the problem may be, and Lord, that it would be uplifting, that Lord, that your hand would touch your child and deliver them from whatever it is that has encased them, whether it be ill will fear, hate, unforgiveness, or Lord, maybe some pestilence that's taken over their body. But Father, again, we just want to give you the thanks and the glory, and thank you, Father, that you've allowed us to come to the throne room of God this morning, and we have come through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and only through him can we come, and will come. And bless his holy name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is who we pray for. If you have your Bibles, find uh, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and uh, I'm going to be reading verses 3 through 14. 3 through 14. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Now, let me stop right there and, and clear your mind. This is not going to be the end of the world, but the end of an age. Amen. It's going to be an end of an age. We're living in the church age. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And he shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes, and divers places. That means many places. All these are the beginnings of sorrow. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. May God add his blessings and understanding to the reading of his holy word. In 1988, a man wrote a book entitled 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come in 1988. He was wrong 88 times. 
1994, a man also predicted that Jesus was going to return in 1994. Turns out he was wrong also. But there are some things that have caused us to really wonder with the things hanging over us if we're really at the end of an age, if we're really at the end of the time that the church age has talked about. I'd like to just point out one of the prophecies, and I'm going to be giving you quite a few signs that I think God has given to us. First of all, there's Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. I will not wait on you. I'm going to continue. And I think it's one of the most fascinating and interesting prophecies going back to the book of Daniel. But he says, the Lord said to Daniel, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. After good paraphrase, its sudden knowledge explosion will occur at the time of the end. Now what time is he talking about? Well, it means the knowledge of God's word will increase. And even though that it's not just physical knowledge, it's the main thing is the knowledge of the word of God will increase. Amen. We have a better understanding of God's word today than our fathers did. God is allowing us to understand it more because it's much easier for us to have the information that they could never have. So a lot of people want to impose it on something. Now listen, first thing is when it speaks of the knowledge increasing, it's meaning first and foremost the knowledge of the Word of God. Now the second thing is, as you're going to see, that they're going to run to and fro. Many shall run to and fro. Those are those that's running up and down in the Scripture study and prophecy and have changed the true doctrines of God's word to make it mean what they want it to so they can write books and sell books and do things such as that. Understand that when God's word has given us this understanding that we will realize that when people run to and fro, a lot of them are not knowledgeable of anything about the word of God. They're just predicting an opinion of theirs but it goes away from the doctrines of the Word of God. Amen. Now, there are times when one computer filled four rooms and had to be climate controlled. Today, we have a little chip that will hold five million bits of information and can consume it within a second. Did you know the Bible itself has 85 million words, and 85,000 words, and do you know that it can be downloaded into this phone of mine in a matter of seconds. So we're seeing the, the great explosion not only scripturally, but we're seeing the great explosion of knowledge that is given here. You know, but it, it has to be understood here that doesn't mean that people will know more, but it means that they have knowledge availability more than they've ever had. Now, I'm going to say this and mean this and mean it with all my heart. I know that our knowledge is very, very uh, accessible to us today. But the problem we got is we've got more ignorant people than we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Even with the knowledge that they have, they ignore it. The only time they go, they go to something and then they forget it. Why? Well, Satan don't want them to know. You take the smartphone. Just ask it a question. It'll give you an answer. Televisions are voice controlled. Cars started without a key. We'd never heard such a thing. The information highways is running at top speed. And we're on that road that is leading to the knowledge of the things of the world. That's why I'm trying to show you that the knowledge of the world and the knowledge of God are two separate things. One is an enemy of God and one is a... a, a a life-giving effort that we're learning more about God. If you want to increase your faith, know more about God. Amen. The more you know about God, the more you'll believe, and the faith will increase. That's right. And you have to realize today we know more about the world because we stay on our phones and we stay on all the computers, and we're just filling our minds with the things of the world, and we wonder where God is going. If you would study your Bible as much as you study your computer and the things in your phone, tell me where you would be. Tell me where would you be in the knowledge of the Word of God, and your faith would increase. And this is happening. 
You see, God says the just shall live by faith. We live by faith. We don't live by fear. Faith will increase when you know more about the thing that you want to know about. If I want to know more about you and I find out more about you, the more I know about you increases our relationship and, and increases my, my thoughts about you. So Jesus says it's no different with him. The more you study God's word, the more your faith will increase. And the more you study the things of the world, I can assure you you're headed in the opposite direction as God intended you to go. That's right. Now the question arises, what will the indication of the end of the age be like? Now that's the same question the disciples asked the Lord. The same question the people that are asking today. I've had that asked to me quite a bit. What about those statements in the New Testament where it says that the end is near? Well, that was going back to maybe a couple of thousand years ago. 1 Timothy 4, 1 said, Now the Spirit speaks expressively, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. You see, people will stay away from the Word of God so long, they will begin a new false doctrine by false teachers, by radio, TV, and, and, and iPhones and computers. Now, how do I mean that, that people are going to hate us in the latter times? Well, as you begin to read about the, the COVID-19 and you sort of put it together and you begin to wonder... Uh, what is the purpose of this? Well, God spoke about a time when they would, people would hate and persecute the Christians, those that were true believers. And one of the things today they're thinking in terms of that it's the church's fault that this epidemic has spread. They're blaming it on a church in South Korea, and they're saying that if they had not uh, had that congregation together and then went off in all the directions spreading it, and then it's occurred to go around the world. And so they blame it on the church in South Korea. They blame it on the Christians. Now let me say this to you. I believe this with all my heart. Now, the bars are screaming, why don't you let us open? But the church is opened up. Now let me say it. Now when the church is open up, and we begin to see what we've seen last weekend on Memorial Day weekend, We've seen the congregants on the beach that was shoulder to shoulder. One woman said she didn't. She was just shoulder to shoulder. One man said he had to leave the beach because he didn't have a place to even set his chair. And then you looked at the pool parties all over, and, and there was just, man, I don't know what. You could stand in a tub of water and had more room than they did. <laughs> you see, this is going to end up spreading this virus, but let me say this to you. The church will receive the blame. They will hate the Christian because we are saying that we're wanting to worship. Doesn't have anything to do with their pool parties or going to the coast or doing anything else in great congregation. They're going to blame the church. And God says they're going to hate us because this is something. You see, nobody can hate somebody and shouldn't. So don't you take me wrong. But you've got to have a reason for hate and if somebody in this church, and, and, and you're going to know somebody that's not a Christian or maybe a Christian, and they're going to get sick and they're going to die or call somebody to die of this virus, they're going to hate the church for it. They're going to hate the Christians for it. And there will be a great falling away from that. So you're about to see that there's more involved than just listening to the news and seeing the thing, there's reasoning behind it, and it's a part of God's plan. You have to see what it's speaking about. 1 Peter uh, 4, 7 says, but the end of all things is at hand. <coughs> Peter wrote that over 2,000 years ago. Now, why? Well, if everything was at hand in Peter's time, how can we say it's at hand in our time? Well, God said that they would be specific signs of the closeness of the time when he would come. In Peter's time, the thing that was happening was there's no longer under law, there's under grace. So as long as they're under grace, that time is near, always near, even through that and even up until today. But the churches now were a good sign, and the nation of Israel is a good sign. 
And in a moment, I'm going to go through some of the things that I hope that will help you in your heart. Because the very time of coming of Jesus to the earth until he returns again is considered the last days. Understand that. You see, we live in the age of grace. And that means we're living in the last day. There will be no more law that we live under. And so in Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus Christ lays out before us what the last generation is going to experience. And that's what I want to preach about today. Is that my introduction? You like that? Amen. So the first thing I want you to see is the last problem. What is the last problem? Uh, he says, look in verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive." One of the problems of the last days is going to be the problem of spiritual deception. There's going to be spiritual deception that you're going to see. Do you know how many people are watching the television preachers that their doctrines are just absolutely not anything to do with God? Oh, no, I, I took my Bible and I read right there and they, they were saying that. Yeah, but look at the opinion that they're doing. The greatest commentary for the Bible is the Bible. That's right. You're not to worry and, and, and move from that, that wonderful thing where God says, look over in the Old Testament or look over in another book, and you begin to get a better understanding of it. But when man's opinion becomes, it becomes a falsification. And now he said, don't let anybody deceive you. Look at verse 5. For many will come in my name, <clears throat> saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. God is saying there's going to be a proliferation, that there's going to be a proliferation of the false Christ and false messiahs in that day. There will be a time of spiritual deception, and I hope and pray that you realize that you've got your Bible before you when you listen to anybody, including me. I don't believe I've ever witnessed a period of time uh, of the people that are capable of spiritual deception as they are right now. Mm -hmm. They'll believe in anything as long as it sets their lifestyle. Something's happened in the American uh, culture today. We've witnessed the abandonment of the Judeo Christian ethic that this nation was uh, established on. We have gone from that. And that, that Judeo Christian uh, ethics is using the Old and the New Testament both to form our laws and our morals that we should live by. And so God has given us those understanding. But I don't have to tell you, you've witnessed that for yourself, that there's uh, people that the morals have gone out the window. There's been an abandonment of spiritual values and moral values because that has left it an immense hole and a void in the soul of American people. <coughs> Someone has said, that man is incurably religious. And I say to you that that's true. I don't care how bad a man is, he believes in something. Even the atheists believe that they believe not. So there's no such thing. They believe in something. Even if it's their own falsification. And so I, I just want to go back and, and in these days of spiritual deception when all kinds of cults and isms are rising up, uh, we need to go take a walk back through the false messiahs that we've watched today. How many of you remember Marshall Applewhite? Mm -hmm. he, and, he and his wife claimed to be Messiah. They had said that uh, when the Hellbot comic came, that God was behind it, and the only way you could meet up is you would drink this poison and lay down and go to sleep, and that God would reap your soul. Now, let me tell you, first of all, what a common is. It's dirt and ice. They believed in dirt and ice that was formed to be a common. And they were telling you that behind that comet, God was hiding. And he was coming through to pick up those that belonged to him. So Marshall Applewhite and his wife, along with 30-some more, drank poison and laid down in their beds and died, thinking they were meeting Christ. There's false messiahs. 
We've seen that in so many of these different people that we have seen uh, that uh, that we've seen so many times that it took people's lives. One of the characteristics would be spiritual deception. Our news media carried an article about shamanism. Now, shamanism is uh, it originated in the Amazon River Basin. And it came to the University of Michigan, which is one of the leading medical schools, whether you realize that or not. And so there was 10 of these shamans came to uh, that university, and they told them that they could cure things. So, but before they could do anything, they had to purify the stage. So one of them took a big mouthful of 150 proof of Bacardi rum and spit it into a candle and said, now the stage is purified. Who needs to be cured? Well, one woman came up and she had the flu and she said in 20 minutes she was healed. That, that shaman breathed on her and she was one man had a bad infection in his leg, and one of the shamans put his mouth on it and sucked the poison out. And his leg was healed. Probably killed the shaman. But the truth of the matter is, what am I saying? Well, I'm saying that if they have the cure for everything, where are they now with COVID-19? You will have spiritual deception. You will have people that come and they may not be preaching God's word, but they're absolutely shysters. Believe it. These men believed what they were doing. They believed it. <coughs> so, you see that these are the things. The second problem Jesus talked about is national violence. Look at verse 6. And ye shall hear wars and rumors of wars. Of course, we know that we're living in the age of war. Since World War II, uh, I don't think there has been a day that somebody hadn't been at war with somebody, nation within the nation. And a Cold War now is, uh, it has been a war also. You've got to realize when God speaks about a war, you may be having a war with your uh, family. You may be having a war with someone in the church. You may be having a war uh, with somebody that you don't like. You see, a Cold War has to do with economics and political values. But you see, a physical war is a war that God is talking about here, that it's armed conflict. That's called a hot war. There have been wars since the time of Jesus. That's what he indicated. He said, when you hear wars and rumors of war, see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. No single war will ever fulfill prophecy. And so many people believe that it will. The only one that will is the war of Armageddon. Now, when he comes again, it will be a world filled with violence. How many of you are looking at the things that's taking place with uh, the, the killing up in Minnesota? And now, the whole nation is using it as an excuse to just exercise what's really in their heart. Uh, they're not into uh, protesting or saying we don't like this. They don't voice their opinions. They go out and commit violence as that police officer committed violence. You see now that they're no different than he. That's anarchy. That's not in any way protesting. Destruction of private property. They're no better off than the people that are committing the crime, that they're saying that they're protesting against. The criminal man is criminal, and the criminal will continue to be a criminal until the Lord sets his heart straight. So when the Lord comes, it's going to be filled with violence. And then the third problem, that there will be international destruction. He says in verse 7, for nations shall rise against nations kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places, I mean many places. <coughs> famine. <coughs> I want to mention famines because there's almost 7.8 billion people on planet Earth as of May this year, 2020. 7.8 billion people. In 2015, they 
took a census and 57 million people died during the world for that year. And 84 million were born. 57 million died of starvation. Understand that we have an epidemic in a question, are we going to be able to produce enough food to, for this many people that uh, the population explosion has done? Jesus said there would be famines as we approach the end of the age. What's happening today in your local grocery store? You see any barren shelves as you go? Are you able to go like you did three or four or five months ago and get whatever it is you want? And no worry whatsoever, I need to get some minute rice, so I go to this store and that store and that store and that store. There's nowhere to be found. You know, it's beginning to show that we are leading and God has given us every sign to see that there is going to be a starvation. There's going to be famine. And that famine in this great country have never experienced what famine would be. We are able to eat at any corner uh, place. I was talking with Jimmy, Jimmy Vernon. And Jimmy said, have you ever tried that little restaurant up there that, that's in that store? And I said, yeah. And he said, it's pretty good, isn't it? But he said, they eat the hamburgers. They can't get the hamburger meat to make hamburgers. Well, how many restaurants is in that kind of shape? They're not able to get the things that they to continue. And you have to realize that famine is now knocking at our door. Famine. Jesus talked about pestilence. What about the new disease which divides uh, antibiotics? The first one I want to mention uh, was caused by the homosexual community. Uh, it was basically what we know as AIDS. And there's still no, no, no vaccine that will cure you from it. Well, just to show you how much we care about what God has to say, our Christian politicians, I said Christian politicians, voted that it would be okay if man and man got married and woman and woman got married, and now they've increased that. Africa has so many people dying of AIDS, you don't hear about it, because they said there's so many that they just quit putting the figures down. But no vaccine. You see, the second one I want you to see is called the Ebola virus. <coughs> that, in just a few days, will turn your body to nothing but just a puddle of slime. And Jesus said there would be pests. So that means more more than one disease. And, and the Ebola virus is now coming back again over there. You see, we've abandoned trying to find a vaccine for that. We're now concentrating here. We're running to and fro trying to figure out one for AIDS. Oh, well, we can't. Well, Ebola, well, we can't. Now let's go over to this one and to that one. COVID-19. As of yesterday... The figures for people in this world, 5,817,385 cases, 362,705 deaths as of yesterday. No vaccine. You see, the greatest risk this virus is in large crowds, large <laughs> gatherings. Did you know that it's telling us that 19 times greater for you to get this virus in crowds, in churches, in restaurants, in theaters, in shopping malls, than it is for you to get it standing outside? Why? Because as I told you in the beginning, the water vapors hold in the air up to three hours. It's not touching the surface. It's inhaling water vapors from someone else. That's why I was talking about the seniors in the church. You see, he's talking about here, this is a new day. May 22nd, 2020, Jesus said there would be pestilence. That means more than one. Right now, we have three major viruses 
that is taking lives. The only reason we don't look back at the other two is since we've got a new one, our attention is there, <clears throat> but the other one has not stopped killing. So when we take a look at the three and there's no vaccine, I wonder where we can get an answer. We said, God, get out of the country. Get out of our labs. Get out of our school. Get out of everything. And some churches says, God, get out. And therefore, you're not going to find an answer until we get on our knees and say, God, forgive us. We have put our trust in man, but we want to ask you to forgive us and we're going to put our trust back in you. Until then, God will not give them their answer. And people will continue to die. <clears throat> then he said there would be earthquakes. Some of the most destructive earthquakes in the world have occurred during the 90s. In 1995, an island in Russia had 7.5 on the Richter scale and 1,989 people died. In 97, northern Iran, 7.5. Magnitude earthquake, 1,560 died. In Qatar, 1998, Afghanistan, at 6.9, the Richter scale, 4,700 deaths. In 1999, in August, in Turkey, uh, 17,127 died. And just a not long ago in Taiwan, magnitude 7.5 and 2,000 people died. <clears throat> On September the 17th, 2015, 12 people died in Ecuador. Now let me say this to you. The preacher, that's not bad if it's just 12. One million became homeless. And you have to realize that that depletes their resources for food, shelter, disease, everything. So how many really would have died with one million people homeless? You see, Jesus said there would be these things all through the days before he came. These are characteristics of an entire age that's before us. No signs of the end of the age, but the end is not yet. False Christ, rumors of wars, famine, pestilence, earthquakes. That characterizes the church age. That's what we have been going through. All of the things that I have mentioned, this is consumed into the church age. And we're living in the church age. And you have to see that all of this is occurring. But they'll be intensified as we draw near to the end of the age. But notice what he says in verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrow. Beginning. It didn't say that this is sorrows and that's that. It said this is only the beginning. So if you have a great fear, you need to take your fear and put it into your faith and ask God to strengthen your faith. And the more you know about God, the stronger your faith will become. Amen. You see, the word sorrow is the word for birth. <clears throat> I don't need to say nothing to you precious ladies who give birth. You know what birth pains are like. When Jesus says the beginning of sorrows, he's mentioning birth pains. As you know, you're going to have them as you're pregnant. But when it gets closer to the time of the birth, they intensify. And God says, that's exactly what is happening with this earth and the, and the church age as he's predicted the things that would come. They're intensified. We've already got two named storms, and they've got to realize that June is when it's supposed to be the beginning of hurricane season, but we've already had two named storms. But let me warn you, that's according to man. We need to get on God's time. Amen. Amen. And that way we would stay prepared. Mm -hmm. This is one of the sad things that we have. 
As we approach the end of the age, they'll become more and more intense and closer and closer together. Man is dependent for his answers on the global crisis today, but the only answer is Jesus Christ. That's right. <coughs> Jesus predicted <coughs> the last day problems. Here's a second interesting prediction. The last day persecution. Then, in verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Who is the you? It's not you. It's Israel. He's talking about the nation of Israel. You see, the reason you don't see the answer is you're not looking for the you. The you is Israel. There has never been a greater anti-Semitism as they are today, hating the Jews. God said that it was going to occur. In other words, let's get it, let's get it right. Racism. <coughs> you can't even, you can't watch television unless uh, the news media is out there promoting, uh, and I'm saying it like it is, they're out there promoting <laughs> violence by the protesters. <coughs> if they would turn off those TV cameras, and quit broadcasting what these people are doing, they wouldn't have a stage to stand on and they'd quit performing. But instead, they pay up the fires, thinking they're informing you. You know what? That's like being in a forest fire. And you're trying to squirt water on the fire, and a noon maybe over here squirting gasoline, thinking. You quit letting people have on the stage, they'll quit acting like idiots. And that's exactly who they are and what they are. Oh, preacher, you, you may get some letters. That's okay. I got a file. You see, the affliction he's talking about is especially that. Now, I want you to listen. <coughs> if you're a racist, don't expect to go to heaven. If you're against any race, I don't care what it is, you're not going to heaven. God will not allow you into his kingdom when you despise your fellow man. How do I know? He says, love one another. Amen. Whites, you love each other. Blacks, you look nice. That's not what he said. Love one another as I have loved you. Amen. And there's nobody neglected. Racism should never be taught. You know, persecution is certainly not new. Uh, we read in the Old Testament how God's people were persecuted. We've watched Hitler massacre uh, millions of Jews. That, uh, and let me say this to you. They're persecuted even God says it would be. And right on the tail of that is the Christian. You know, we're, we're experiencing some Christian bashing today. We're getting a little taste of some of the persecution that's coming. In the 1900s, over 100 million Christians worldwide have, have died for their faith. More Christians have been martyred in this generation than any other generation before. In this generation. Why? Because they're not unashamed. They're, they're not ashamed of Jesus Christ in their lives. You see, I believe with all my heart this is going to occur. I'm sure most of you have heard of the wrestler Jesse Ventura. He's the only person out of the Reformation, uh, as you're a Republican, Democrat, Independent, there's also a party called the Reformation Party. And, and he has a message for you. Now remember, he was uh, the mayor uh, from in the 90s of, of uh, Minneapolis, and then he became the governor from 1999 to 2003. And, uh, and here's what Jesse had to say to the Christian people. Organ
organized religion is a crutch for weak-minded people who need strength in numbers. In other words, your belief in Jesus Christ is only a crutch. And you need to gather together to get your strength together because you're weak-minded. What a blessing he is. Because you might now begin to wonder how the Islamic woman was elected to the Senate out of Minnesota. People like Jesse Ventura. Do you wonder why that we are beginning as a nation to begin to shrink in its morals and allow any and everything to be a, a leader in this nation? Ungodly leadership leads to ungodly and if you are looking at the violence, it's because we're living in ungodly times. Amen. Reformed thinking. What is that? Well, that's called a moral. What do you mean by moral preacher? I'm talking about, do you know what an immoral person is? That's a person that, that does something he shouldn't do and he knows it. In other words, he, uh, he may have uh, cursed or drank or done something wrong. He has immorality. And then there's the moral person, the moral person who, who tries to live right and not break the law. But then you have reformative people like Jesse Ventura who are able. <coughs> able will mean that every single thing I do is right regardless of what anybody else says. And that's who he is. And that's who was the governor of Minnesota. <coughs> Missionaries. Missionary Jim Elliott and four other missionaries were murdered in, uh, for their faith by the UK Indians in Ecuador. They were there to evangelize those Yuka Indians, and they killed them. But did you know today we have a different kind of missionary? Columbine was one of the places that we've seen one of those missionaries, <coughs> excuse me, Casey Bernal. Casey Bernal died for her faith. If you don't denounce Jesus Christ, we will kill you, and they blowed her face off. We're having more and more people that stand for Jesus Christ that are the true missionaries of God because today it is the different missionary that we have. Amen. It is not the missionary that's going out on the mission field. The mission field is here. Here. Violence increasing. On October excuse me, September the 15th at Wedgwood Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. A man walked in and started shooting. He killed seven, wounded seven. In Charleston, South Carolina, a young man walks in a prayer meeting and kills all of them. We're seeing more and more and more people, deranged people coming into churches, opening fire, shooting because they're anti-Baptist, anti-Christian, anti-God. And this will increase. This will intensify. People are walking into churches and shooting the worshipers. In the last days there will be persecution and terror. Verse 10, and many will be offended and betray one another and hate one another. You know, we have a level of Christian commitment today that's shameful. I'm sorry if that offends you, but God said it would. Verse 10 also says, And then shall be many offended. Why? Well, first of all, let me say this to you. It's election time. In comes a bunch of people that need our vote. They're politicians. Oh, they're politicians, all right, and they, they're Christians. Then they go back to Washington, and 
and they vote for abortion. Mm -hmm. Then they go into the North Carolina State House and, and they vote for uh, the strict laws of, of drunk driving and then in the same sense vote for more liquor stores. <coughs> Excuse me. You're going to have to see that it's popular to be a Christian. But with <coughs> what I had just previously said to you, that when the Christians now are going to get blamed for things, they're no longer popular. Therefore, God said there'll be a great falling away. You know why? I said it and mean it. When he talked about the wheat and the tares, the tares are leaving the church. The very ones that we say are Christians. God says they're not wheat, they're tares. They will flee the church. <clears throat> when Christianity is no longer popular. We're living in a day where there will be great persecution. Mark me down. You, you and I may be in heaven, but it's going to happen. It's not going to be all that popular to be a Christian in a short period of time. I don't even give it till the end of the year. Being a Christian will not be popular. Am I prophesying that? Actually, I'm not, but I'm just saying the way it's moving and as fast as it's moving, I wouldn't be surprised. Amen. <clears throat> now, here's the third thing, and I'll be finished. He predicted that there'd be last time preaching. <laughs> Did you know there are going to be two kinds of preaching in the last day? They're going to be what I call false preaching and faithful preaching. And many false prophets will arise and deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. One false preaching will be the category of apostasy. They'll speak of some of the faith, but they'll water it down and dilute it so bad that it's not really God's word. The other kind of false preaching is called apostasy. And they're claiming to believe the doctrines of the faith. But they're a hireling. That's the day the will of God in the church versus the will of God in the church. In other words, what they're going to do is they're going to please the people. They're going to start out with the true word of God. And then they're going to turn around and make sure that they're satisfying the people instead of Almighty God. It is called the Church of Laodicea. The will of the people instead of the will of God. And that is what's happening today. You should be shocked if you went to some of the churches today. Many of them won't even let them have a cross. It might offend someone. You'd be stunned how many people, if you walked into the church, would sound more like a rock and roll church or a rock and roll band or a nightclub than it would be God's house. You'd be shocked if you knew how many preachers today have said you can't give them the straight gospel. You have to water it down a little bit so they can understand it. That's what Christ called a hireling. He's not called of God. He has went to college. He's got, he's Dr. Flubody. And Dr. Flubody, he goes out and you know what he says? He's got a sheepskin on his wall that says, I'm a doctor. So the bigger churches, they hire Dr. Peabody, and he comes in, and what does he do? Because he's a doctor who is going to, in any way, challenge. I want you to listen to me. Do you know how?
how many doctors are in churches that are pastors, that are doctors of psychology, doctors of business, but they're not doctors of theology. And the people didn't care. We've got to have a doctor. You're right, but you need a psychiatrist and it needs to be a Christian. Because your thinking is God. I still love Jim's saying about hunting dogs. He said that hunting dog may cost a thousand dollars and it may have a, a big old piece of paper and you hang that paper on the wall and says that dog is a hunting dog. And Jim said, but that dog won't hunt, it ain't worth the paper it's written on. Right. Right. You know. I'm going to preach the word of God without complete favor of anybody until Jesus takes me in death or in the rapture. Amen. You have to realize that I didn't preach for him. I ran from him. And now the hounds of heaven have caught me and I'm going to do exactly what I promised. Him. Whatever I have left is his completely. Praise God. Verse 14, the very last verse I mentioned. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness to the nation and then shall the end come. The churches and people sometimes get so confused. Does that mean that the whole world will become Christian? No. God didn't call us to make Christians. He called us to evangelize. And let them ask him that they become Christians. Amen. We evangelize by the word of God. Telling people about Jesus. Telling people that's how you evangelize. There's a man on his deathbed and I want him to the Lord. His alcoholic son <coughs> came to me and said, Preacher, I don't know. Can I hug you? I'm sure. He said, I want to thank you for saving my dad. I said, whoa. I can't save myself. Oh, yes, you saved my dad. No, son. Your daddy was saved by God, not me. I evangelized the man by telling him about Christ. He made his own decision. And by his own decision of who Jesus is in his life and who he is, he became a Christian when God says he, he means it. Therefore, God gave him that word Christian or believer or child of God. No preacher can save you. I can't save myself. I want you to understand that. Our command is not to Christianize the world, but our command is to evangelize the world. John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life. When you realize you're a sinner and by faith turn from your sins and you turn to Jesus Christ, and by faith, that means I, I, I've just died for my sins. And, and, and I mean, means I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose again the third day. And whosoever believes that and receives him into their heart truthfully <coughs> will be saved. Now maybe <coughs> you're out there today. And maybe you think you're saved or maybe you're not sure. Today is the day. You don't have to come to this altar, but you can if you will. And as Scott comes, he's going to sing two verses <coughs> of the invitation of him. And what we're going to do is we're going to have you give you an opportunity. If you're by live streaming and you're not sure about your salvation, kneel at your chair where you're at and ask God to forgive you. And then next Sunday, if it's possible, you come and make it public. Now, why do you want to make it public? Because God 
says, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you. Let me tell you something. Walk me out. Fear nothing of man, but be pleasing to God. And if you're not willing to make it public, you most likely are not going to ever be a servant of God. I say this to you with all my heart. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. We're not guaranteed anything, but we're guaranteed of this. If you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and mean it in your heart, and know that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. You will be saved. Come before the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that you'll just search hearts and minds today. And this will be a time when many will come, knowing that Jesus Christ will be Lord. And we thank you through his precious and holy name. Amen. <laughs> Father, keep us safe till we meet again.